quick little three, a three and a half second sting, and then away we go. France Grenier has been warning South Africans about the prospect of what has happened over the last 72 hours. And uh, we've got him here with us in our virtual studio. France, good to be talking with you. Uh, you, the outgoing CEO of the Institute for Race Relations, uh, is that the way we still describe you at the moment? Yeah, that's exactly the way that you describe me at the moment, Alec. I am the, the outgoing CEO of the Institute of Race Relations and uh, quite what I'm next uh, going to be, I'm not sure. Okay, so it's still, however, um, occupying your mind what's going on in South Africa and clearly you're not going to be leaving the scene uh, into the future. Well, we'll, we'll see. We'll, we'll wait and see. Um, um, I'm not um, uh, actually entirely sure uh, what's going to be next, so I'm not actually able to answer your question with any um, sort of specifics. But hopefully you can answer my other questions, which relate to what you've been telling us now for a long time. I remember sitting down with you and having a cup of coffee in Cape Town at one of the World Economic Forum events and thinking, no, this guys he, he's, he's far too pessimistic. It can't be what he's telling us. And yet, my goodness, what we've witnessed over the last few days uh, is beyond most people's perception of what could ever happen in South Africa. Yeah, no, uh, regrettably, Alec, I think we've, we've got this call right. We, we have been skeptical about the reform potential of the South African government, and we were uh, skeptical uh, somewhat. Uh, we, we were open to the possibility that, indeed, the Ramaphosa administration could turn things around in the sense that we knew he had the authority to do so if he chose to do so. But we were sceptical, more so than most analysts. I think that scepticism has been borne out. I think the reform movement is largely still born. And uh, yeah, over the past two years at least, we released a little note on a Monday morning to our clients about the state of the world. And I yesterday asked the, the analysts that helped me write that, go and pull just some examples of what we've been saying on anarchic protest action and looting. And yeah, with some regularity over the past two years, we've been saying that this is a risk for South Africa, that you will get inflection points, that's what we call them, that cause things to, to blow up a little bit. And that is what happened over the past 72 hours. The Center for Risk Analysis, the Monday reports, I'm an avid listener and uh, not always a, a good start to the week, but better to be forewarned and to understand what is going on. And maybe you can unpack it for us through your eyes, what you see happening in South Africa right now. Yeah, it's, it's kind of straightforward, I think. I was just on one of these earlier, and I, I said that. Um, here are the pieces of the puzzle. The first one is that more than half of young people do not have a job. Uh, they wake up every morning, not sure what the day is going to hold for them. They don't have that sense, you know, that dignity of labor, of earning something, going back to their families and saying, we did this for you. Um, that's a very powerful social force. Our schools are rubbish, frankly. Um, about four in a hundred kids will pass maths in high school with a grade of 50% or higher. Now, that would be less of a problem if we were still the structure of GDP of 1950, but we're not. We're a, a high-tech, high-skilled, post-industrial economy. And schools leave the majority of young people in a position where they are unlikely to be gainfully employed and very unlikely to ascend to the middle classes. So that's a problem. Third piece of, of the puzzle is real per capita GDP. That's been flat for a decade. And uh, stagnation has set in on the back of what was a very important and, and quite impressive rise in living standards that South Africa experienced in its first decade as a democracy. And if you have such a rise and then followed by stagnation, 
the expectations you created in the initial rise are unmet, and that breeds a lot of political frustration. So there's a third piece of the puzzle. Fourth piece of the puzzle is that there are now significantly more people who are entitled to vote but choose not to do so than the number of people who vote for the ANC. And in, in that respect, the ANC is in fact not the majority party in the country anymore. The majority party is in fact not a party. It's a group of frustrated South Africans who look around the political spectrum and think that they don't see anything that represents their interests or that they can believe it. So that's, that's presence. You have this very high level of exclusion of young people from the economy. You have this deep political disillusionment. I think I got to about four issues. Let's say this is the fifth. The fifth is reform. Uh, Cyril has blown it. The, the window to introduce the substantive labor market and education and related reforms necessary for South Africa to be positioned as a more investment destination has been let slip. And as a consequence on policy, it's an extraordinary thing to say, we stand by it. There is nothing coming out of this administration that can address that exclusion. And when you put those five points together, the exclusion, nothing on the way to address it, and the deep political disillusionment, then the analysis becomes becomes more easy. It becomes easier. You need a spark. And if you get a spark, you're likely to set off a, a chain reaction of events. Mr. Zuma was that spark. That's all he is in this. He's a spark. There's no great longing for him to return to power. No one really wants that. Uh, we saw the polls at Nazrek when he was defeated. Mr. Ramaphosa was orders of magnitude more popular than uh, Mr. Zuma or his, his uh, hoped-for successor. So that that's this isn't uh, Zuma exerting any great... The, the, the great power here, the force at play, is not Zuma. It's the, it's the exclusion and the absence of reform that means that it has been, like Mr. Zuma, that's actually what he is, is able to, to trigger uh, such dramatic events as we've seen over the past 72 hours. So if you have such a lot of history uh, um, behind what has now occurred, how does one unravel where we are today? Or how does one correct it uh, if you are sitting in uh, uh, the shoes of the average South African who's bemused and frightened uh, by what has occurred? Well, if you want the way out, the way out is easy. And, and we don't need to reinvent any wheels. We need to go back, look at events in the late 1980s and the 1990s, because growth was, again, uh, very volatile and very low for that volatility. Real per capita GDP hadn't done much for a decade. The, the security forces were trying to, to uh, maintain order and weren't able to do so then. They, they'll struggle to do so now as well. There was great political disillusionment. All of that was in place. And what happened is that a reformist administration was introduced in that of, of, of Mandela and Mbeki, most notably after Mandela's very important 1992 speech at Davos, where he said, we will be pragmatic. Early ANC policy documents said that social protection must be funded through growth and not through borrowing. I mean, it's, it's basics. Uh, property rights were largely respected in the country. The fiscal prudence, I mean, 13 years into power, the ANC ran a budget surplus. I mean, that's arch fiscal conservatism. It worked for them. The country calmed down immensely relative to what it had been uh, just 15 years prior. In that first decade in power, the number of people with a job in South Africa doubled. And Alec, today, there are less people with a job in the country than was the case 10 years ago. It's, it's a complete opposite of what we saw in the first decade as, as a democracy. Government debt levels were cut in half. And despite that, and the fiscal prudence, we rolled out as a country the most expansive social welfare system of any emerging market that did a lot of good to raise the basic living standards 
of poor people. And what was at the core of that? Of course, there were contradictions in policy and there were mistakes and things could have been better and we could have grown the economy faster in the first decade. All of that's true. But there was a basic level of pragmatism that you need to draw very high levels of investment in order to generate the growth to make possible the opportunities and the revenues to support lifting standards of living. In the Ramaphosa administration, there is a fundamental contradiction because the recovery strategy is premised as much as anything. The centerpiece of economic policy under Ramaphosa is an expropriation strategy. And he has tried to explain to the country that we can do expropriation in a manner that will attract investment. We've been arch critics of this from day one. We've said it's a non-starter. It's a red light flashing across on top of the door to the investment door to the country. And it's that that's gone so badly wrong for his administration. As long as expropriation remains a centerpiece of government policy, the threat implicit therein means that we will not draw the fixed investment to get the growth rate back up to what it was at the end of the Mbeki era, which is necessary to sustain the same lifts in employment and, and living standards that we recorded in that era, which is necessary in turn to, to see that we avoid going through a cycle of the kind of violent blow-ups that we're talking about uh, today. The rationality of your argument is, is uh, unimpeachable. However, politics is not rational. People are, and people appear to be making a plan, uh, talking with uh, particularly the Afrikaner community. Uh, they, they're now looking to not create a parallel state, but a parallel to the state, take responsibility within their own communities. We're even seeing this during the looting and the violence where communities are getting together to protect their own areas. But it sounds to me like that is a future of bubbles, of bubbles of perhaps order and affluence and in a sea of, uh, of, of poverty and, and chaos. Yeah, that, How are you reading that? That's the enclave future. We wrote a book about it in 2014 and, and the second one in 2017. And we said that one of the outcomes for South Africa is a future of enclaves where the authority of the state will recede. We're seeing that. that that's what you're really seeing now. You're seeing the authority of Pretoria recede. And in the vacuum, uh, we suggested various um, uh, new sort of power plays will, will emerge. And one of those will be that in relatively prosperous communities, um, ordinary people will take upon themselves what were once the responsibilities of the state. And uh, we've got a writer this morning uh, writing for us on, on these militias, which is probably not the wrong word to use, that have arisen to, to safeguard uh, uh, neighborhoods and communities, especially in the town. Extraordinary pictures, Alec. There's a video clip of um, a bunch of what I, I take to be young uh, Muslim men uh, chanting Allah Akbar as the advancing horde approaches. I mean, extraordinary stuff uh, uh, to witness. But uh, what it is a representative of is the enclave phenomena. And I do think that to some extent, communities that are very well organized, and are able to take upon themselves what were once the responsibilities of the state, will be more robustly positioned to withstand some of these blow-ups than might be the case in communities that outsource those responsibilities to South Africa's government. But that's not a long-term future. All you need is for somebody to shoot. And who no, knows no, quite, what the consequences quite, could be. Quite, this is where we are this morning. I mean, you. Yeah. this is where we are. Uh, no, it's not a long-term future for the country to be prosperous. But I think where the, the enclave phenomena, I think it's not just the South Africa phenomena. I think South Africa is, is in a strange way at the cutting edge of a global phenomena where advances in, in technology and communications technology and even something as mundane as now work from home matched with the potential influence of crypto and cyber currencies, 
means that the reasons for the modern state begin to crumble and fall away. And you might see, I, I think we could even, even in, in the fullness of time, see a global uh, a move towards enclave formation, where or balkanization, uh, call, call it that. We, we've spoken to clients about that in Western democracy, starting to happen as well. So I don't think it's a purely South Africa phenomena. I think it's got, it's got long legs and might become a dominant global theme over the next 20 or 30 years. But for the here and now, yeah, it offers you the opportunity to fend off the invading horde, but it, it doesn't offer the country a much of a, a prospect beyond that. If, if your question to me is leading to what happens next, there's some risks exactly. we need to avoid now. Yeah. But I go back to a 2014 call, which is, is deceptive in its simplicity. We became a democracy. Alec, 25 years ago, so that if we ever reach the point that we are at now, where the country is not well governed to the advantage of the great majority of its people, that those people will resort to a future election to be the inflection point towards reform. And in 2014, we said, in, we wrote it down, published it for the first time, we don't think the ANC is going to make it as South Africa's governing party for very much longer. And my call to clients over the recent past, I mean, that would be a couple of years, has been, I think the ANC is going to lose an election. And I think it could lose in 2024. And if it doesn't lose in 2024 and we maintain the basic trappings of being a democracy, I cannot see that the ANC will have a national majority over South Africa by the end of the 2020s. And that's a, a partly, of course, our intuition and experience, but only partly. We've done a lot of polling in recent years. ANC is not looking good at all. Its 57% result in 2019 is disproportionately a function of an older block of voters who have uh, uh, appreciated the extent to which South Africa even now is a better place, much better place for most people than it was uh, at the end of the apartheid era. But amongst younger people, it's now the case that the ANC is polling at 50% or below. And if you do some of the demographic projections on that and you factor in uh, life expectancy levels, then on the demographics alone, by the end of this decade, on the maths of it, I cannot see how the ANC, even if it does reform, maintains a comfortable national majority in South Africa. So the end game here is the deceptively simple one, that there'll be some protest and violence, anarchy, as, as there is. I mean, this isn't new. I mean, we, we, we're a pretty volatile place on a normal day of the week, and the data is strong on that. I think what's going to happen here is the ANC is just going to lose an election. And that is going to be the inflection point towards uh, a future reform in the form. And look, I'll stay out on a limb. I've lived on a limb for 20 years. I'll stay out on the edge of that limb. The ANC defeat will, will be the catalyst for the emergence of a new political movement, uh, in many respects later read to be uh, uh, an echo of the gear era of Mandela and Mbeki, South Africa will, led by this new group, uh, uh, recover strongly through the 2030s to become one of the world's most exciting emerging markets. And Alec, you know as well, if there's some of your listeners that don't, you know, we aren't the good news guys. We're about as hard assed hard-edged conservative analysts as you get. <laughs> so when we tell you that we think this ends for the ANC, perfectly democratically, and that in the aftermath of that, something new appears and leads South Africa with great success into the 2030s. There's a great advantage these days, I find, in having a, a reputation as a conservative dinosaur, is that when you tell people there are upsides down the line, they've got to take you seriously, because we don't, we don't if we didn't think there were, we wouldn't say that, 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 that there were. So Phoenix rising from the ashes of what we're seeing in the last few days. 
you know, don't make you know, and, and the last few weeks and the last few years, and you, know, you can take it back wherever you want to take it. I take it back to the Polakwane conference of the ANC. Because what happened there is the party rejected the pragmatism of that 1992 speech at Davos that had actually brought about a quite substantive improvement in living standards. And lest anyone forget, you know, we, some people argue this with me, it wasn't so great, you know, was it really as good as it was? What you can't, you can't actually argue that either, but what you definitely can't argue is the, is the piercing point that in uh, 2004, a decade after Mandela had led the ANC to freedom and victory, under Mbeki, with gear in full throw, the ANC was six percentage points stronger than it had been under Mr. Mandela. And the reason was that it was getting it right and life was improving and getting better for almost all South Africans. The party threw that away just a few years later at the Polikwane conference and, and picked Mr. Zuma and did all sorts of odd things. And uh, uh, it, 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 we, we will need to go back to that era. Go back to gear, essentially. There's a controversial statement. And if we do that, then the, the road to recovery, uh, prosperity, uh, stability and future success will will open up for us again